A happy worker is an effective worker. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 workplace innovations. They even have a union of 8 to 18 year old laborers called UNATSPO, the Union of Child and Adolescent Workers. For this list, we're looking at benefits, policies, and modernizations that made the workplace what it is today. We will only be including innovations to paid workplaces, not for volunteering or internship positions. What have the unions ever really given us? A workforce that runs this company and has made you a millionaire? Number 10, workers' compensation. There is a way for the average guy to get what's coming to him. It's called compensation. In ancient Sumeria, dating to around 2020 BC, King Ornamu outlined the city-state of Ur's laws on financial compensation and specific compensation was made to bodily workers whose bodies were injured. Hammurabi's written code allowed law to be a matter of public knowledge and so helped advance the rule of law in society. Similarly, in 1750 BC, the Code of Hammurabi set forth similar rules, providing rewards for specific injuries, as did many other ancient societies such as the Greco-Roman, Arab, and Chinese, some of which even provided specific compensation schedules and exact payments. Another big leap forward occurred toward the end of the Industrial Age as countries like Canada and the United States paved the way for more progressive rules that better protect and compensate workers injured while performing work-related duties. I could club myself in the head with Sam's hammer! Better yet, if you ask him real nice, he might do it for you. You send more than one blue-collar brother down soap opera lane. Number 9. Unemployment Benefits these social welfare payments made by governments are usually paid to those who are registered as unemployed and can prove they are actively seeking work. I'd like some welfare, please. Depending on which country you're in, these benefits can range anywhere from a limited sum that will cover only essential purchases to larger amounts covering entire days of lost income. The first unemployment insurance plan was established in 1911 with the United Kingdom's National Insurance Act. It was introduced by the Liberal government to fight back against the Labour Party's rising support among the working class. She's one of more than one million Americans receiving long-term emergency unemployment, up to 99 weeks instead of 26. Indeed, the act remains popular among workers even today, as do similar programs worldwide, as they insure workers during sickness and in difficult periods. Occupation. Gladiator. Did you kill last week? No. Did you try to kill last week? Yeah. Now listen, this is your last week of unemployment insurance. Either you kill somebody next week or we're going to have to change your status. You got it? Number eight, child labor laws. In Bolivia, there are million of children and adolescents working, and 50% of them are children under 14 years old who work. One unfortunate side effect of the Industrial Revolution was that child mortality rates grew due to the use of child workers in dangerous factories and other hazardous sites. The United States was the first country to react to the mounting death toll. State-of-the-art machinery shook and pounded the walls of these mills from dawn till dusk, and all the while children kept time with the relentless beat. Though Britain created factory acts to limit the hours children worked, in 1836, Massachusetts enacted the first state child labor law. It was in 1938, however, that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt finally passed the Fair Labor Standards Act, the first federal law to regulate child labor in the U.S., by setting minimum employment ages and work hours. As a result, child labor, at least in more developed countries, is now seen as a human rights violation. But because kids can make as much as $40 a day, about 10 times what a gravestone polisher or street clown earns, it's not likely kids will stop working in the mines anytime soon. Number 7. Paid Holidays In the early 20th century, though he wasn't first to submit the idea, U.S. President William Howard Taft made public his belief that a healthy workforce needed two to three months off every year to cure the office blues and avoid burnouts. The stress of my modern office has caused me to go into a depression. Depression? Isn't that just a fancy word for feeling bummed out? Dwight, you ignorant slut! Unfortunately for Taft, the legislature thought otherwise. 
but Europeans picked up on his suggestion, and in the 1930s, several European countries introduced paid vacation time for workers. Even today, EU countries are far ahead of North America in terms of paid vacation time, with countries like France, the UK and Scandinavian nations legally obliged to give upwards of 25 paid days off per year. The US guarantees none. Studies say those who do get paid time off get an average of about two to three weeks each year. But almost a full quarter of workers here don't get any time off at all. Number six, unions. On every job there's a trade union to represent the workers, to speak on their behalf in the workshop. In 18th century England, the Industrial Revolution created a massive increase in the number of laborers, many of whom were new to the workforce and some of whom were unskilled. Besides maternity leave, weekends off, and workers' compensation, tell me one thing that the unions have really contributed to the workplace. Fair wages. Outlawing discrimination. And did you know union workers make 30% more than non-union workers? Though attempts to unionize had been made earlier, the first true organization efforts came in the 1810s. Though at this point, unions were still illegal and remained so until 1871. But the organization only increased from there, negotiating fairer pay and better working conditions for their members. That's okay, buddy. We're from the union. The union? We represent the workers in all magical industries, both evil and benign. Oh, all right. Are you feeling at all degraded or oppressed? Uh, a little. Well, we don't even have dental. By the end of the century, nations like the US, France, and Germany had followed suit with labor or trade unions becoming a locomotive force of change in the life of the worker. Who harvest the fruits of land and sea to feed the world, shall have voice in the world's government and shall share in the good things their labor produces. Number five, parental leave. Maternity or paternity leave is a period of work leave, either paid or unpaid, but usually with guaranteed job security given to parents after the birth of a child. <laughs> Various countries around the world adopted such policies during the 20th century, with Sweden, for example, introducing maternity leave in 1937. Halfway around the world in Sweden, a whole country of men are making full-time fatherhood seem like a dream job. In 1974, Sweden became the first country to replace maternity leave with a gender-neutral parental leave, so fathers could also opt to stay home with their families. The expansion acknowledges the fact that both parents play a role in the development of their children. Instead of additional time off, the French government offers a family allowance every month to help pay for child expenses. Today, parental leave policies vary significantly worldwide, with Swedish law allowing up to 480 paid days and U.S. law providing none. There are seven countries who don't have laws requiring paid maternity leave. Suriname, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Papua New Guinea, Tonga, the United States of America, Palau. Wait, what? Number four, retirement pension. I mean, that's it for me. From here on in, you consider my ass retired. Jesus Christ. Don't blaspheme. God damn it. I said don't do that. After decades of dedicated service, don't you think workers are entitled to some financial comfort in their golden years? That's basically the idea of a retirement pension. And today, you'll find that most developed countries do offer some form of it. It's generally believed that the first pensions originated in Germany in the mid-1600s, where the widows of clergymen and later teachers received funding. By the end of the 19th century, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck of Germany pushed through the Old Age and Disability Insurance Bill, which originally set the age of eligibility at 70 and later 65. I'm too old for this shit. Though pensions are now at risk due to aging populations, they are still a vital part of today's workplace. Number three, human resources. I'm a bit of a spark plug and a human resources lady. Oh, oh you know, it, it's actually, it's Pam. I'm sorry. A business's HR department has many responsibilities, including but not limited to hiring and all that entails, as well as employee relations and more. Its purpose is essentially to maximize output by keeping employees happy and thus limiting turnover. Sometimes I download pirated music onto my work computer. Who hasn't? Good. Good. 
What no, else? No, I, I'd like to hear more about that. <laughs> As was the case for many workplace innovations, the history of HR began during the Industrial Revolution. But it was 1913 before the Welfare Workers Association was formed in England which was one of the first groups of its kind in the world. So pretty much we work with the employees right through from application to retirement. And that could be anything from looking after their safety, to training, to providing wellness programs or diversity events. Since then, human resources management and employer-employee relations have changed. The modern HR department helps employees achieve self-actualization and gets employers to recognize employees as valuable human assets. What do you say we interview you? Uh, all right, yes, that's a uh, sometimes useful exercise. Please put your hand down. Number two, minimum wage. The workers are demanding minimum pay of $15 an hour. In mid-14th century England, the first laws regarding wages actually set a maximum wage. Fortunately, this was altered toward the end of the century, when the cost of food was used as a guide to establish a living wage. 1604's Act Fixing a Minimum Wage made minimum wage official for members of the textile industry. And we just love not making minimum wage or getting the Social Security. By the end of the 19th century, New Zealand and Australia were enacting the first national minimum wage laws to aid workers in becoming more financially independent. The United States followed in 1938, and today, although minimum wage rates differ significantly depending on the country, this advancement increased the world's standard of living and morale, and reduced poverty and inequality. We get by just fine here on minimum wage, if love is a labor, I'll slave to the end. Before we unveil our top choice, here are some honorable mentions. Okay, but well, the money's good, plus you get to stare at Rachel as much as you want. What? Flexible hours. Oh. Yeah, you know, I figured uh, I could use a little job stability. Oh, I'm sorry. Get health insurance. It's pretty good. Hey, honey, the cable guy's coming today. Can you let him in? But this is my work area. I'm working from home. So if he knocks on the door, you may or may not let him in. You're qualified and personable and bright and, uh, and black. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, that, that too. Number one, the eight hour workday. Can you imagine working a grueling 10 to 16 hour day in a dangerous factory six days a week? That was the reality for many during Britain's Industrial Revolution. But thanks to figures like prominent socialists Robert Owen and Karl Marx, the eight-hour workday, and consequently the 40-hour work week, eventually became a reality. Owen's slogan read, quote, eight hours labor, eight hours recreation, eight hours rest. And slowly but surely, the legal length of workdays around the world shortened to 12, then 10, and finally to eight hours long. I generally come in at least 15 minutes late. Uh, I use the side door, that way lumber can't see me. <laughs> and. Uh, and after that, I just sort of spaced out for about an hour. In fact, it wasn't until the mid-20th century that most industrialized countries began limiting the work week to 40 hours and offering overtime pay for additional work. Do you know if we get the overtime bonus on this one? Counting's over there. Ask them. No, I don't need to. I already know the answer. I'm an intern. So I don't qualify for OT. But. Without such laws, we're betting you'd be a lot more exhausted than you are right now. I'm up. Mm. Hey, Taff, how's work? I can't talk. I'm too tired. Do you agree with our list? Which other workplace innovations belong on our list? Now, if you feel that the bare minimum is enough, then... For more laborious top tens published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. Let's do this. You know, you guys are hired. You're in, you know, unless you're like the weirdest guys ever and I don't see it. Great.